a super-Earth, ready to be explored, is floating in space relatively close to us, a mere 337 light-years away from our planet. The term super-Earth is used to describe a planet beyond the solar system, with a mass higher than that of Earth, but below those of the ice giants of the solar system, Uranus and Neptune. Their masses are 14.5 and 17 times that of our planet, respectively. The term also refers only to the mass of the planet, not its habitability or surface conditions. But the coolest thing about this newly discovered super-Earth is that it might harbor a second, Earth-sized planet. The bigger planet is dubbed Toi 715b. It orbits within the conservative habitable zone of its parent star. Moving within this region means there might be liquid water on the planet's surface. Of course, several other factors need to line up for the surface water to appear. But the conservative habitable zone, unlike the optimistic, habitable zone, makes the planet a great candidate for harboring water. As for the smaller planet, it's likely to be just a bit larger than Earth. And it might also dwell inside the conservative habitable zone. NASA's James Webb Space Telescope, as well as other new space-borne instruments, are designed not only to detect distant worlds, but also to reveal some of their main features, including the composition of their atmospheres. And based on this knowledge, we can get clues to the possible presence of life there. The newly discovered super-Earth Toi 715 Bon orbits a red dwarf, a star smaller and cooler than our Sun. At the moment, such stars remain prime candidates for finding habitable planets orbiting them. Those miniature rocky worlds have far closer orbits than those circling around stars like our Sun. But since red dwarfs are small and cool, the planets don't risk anything when crowding closer. They're still safely within the star's habitable zone. Tighter orbits also mean that planets cross the faces of their stars more often. In the case of Toy 715b, it's once every 19 days. That's how long a year in this mysterious distant world lasts. Star crossing, or transiting, planets can be detected more easily and observed more frequently. And it's great for Tess the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which found the new planet. This satellite has been adding to a long list of habitable zone exoplanets since its launch in 2018. Unfortunately, observing such transits for Earth-sized planets moving around Sun-like stars is beyond the capability of the space telescopes we have today. Plus, it takes too long, an entire year, to wait for a new transit. Planet Toi 175b is now on the list of habitable zone planets that can be examined more closely by the James Webb Telescope. Who knows? Maybe this awesome instrument will spot signs of an atmosphere surrounding the planet. Its presence, or absence, will depend on other properties of the planet, like its mass and size. Also, we need to figure out whether it can be classified as a water world. If it is, then its atmosphere, if present, will be more prominent and less difficult to detect than that of a more massive, drier, and denser planet, likely to keep its low-profile atmosphere close to the surface. Experts say that Toi 715b might have once had an atmosphere thicker than that of Neptune, and now the planet could be in a transition state where it's losing its atmosphere. To confirm this suspicion, scientists need to figure out the planet's mass. Once they do it, they'll likely know whether TOI 715b is a watery terrestrial planet. By the way, if the second, yet unconfirmed, Earth-sized planet turns out to be real, it will be the smallest habitable zone planet ever discovered by TESS. At the moment, James Webb is our best bet for observing the characteristics of these faraway worlds. But in the coming years, the next generation of ground-based, extremely large telescopes will be able to peer deeper into space, looking for new exoplanets. 2022 and 2023 have been landmark years for discovering new, fascinating worlds. Last year, NASA surpassed 5,000 confirmed exoplanets. The list is incredibly diverse. It includes rocky super-Earths, gas giants like Jupiter, ice giants like Neptune, and so on. 
And this is just the beginning. There might be more than a trillion exoplanets in our galaxy alone. But the most important question is, how many of them are habitable, you know, for us? Are there any planets on this list that could have life on them? Or that could be a future home for us? Of course there are. And in 2022-2023, we found as many as five of them. So buckle up and hang on for a wild ride beyond our solar system. The first planet on our list is Wolf 1069b, a boring and stodgy designation. So, I'll simply nickname it Wolfie, because hey, who's gonna stop me, NASA? (laughs) A new study conducted by 50 starry-eyed astronomers confirmed something awesome. This exoplanet, Wolfie, which is located just 31 light-years away from us, could potentially be a rocky world. In other words, theoretically, it's a habitable planet. The team behind this discovery used a technique called radial velocity to detect the exoplanet. This is a way scientists study the movements of stars and planets. It's as if when you're playing catch with a friend, as they throw the ball to you, you can see it coming closer and closer. It's kind of like radial velocity. When a planet is moving towards us, it makes the star it orbits appear to be coming closer to us. When the planet is moving away from us, it also makes the star look more distant. Scientists can use this information to figure out what the planet is doing and how big it is. And that's how they found Wolfie. This exoplanet is estimated to be the Earth's size and about one and a third times the mass of our planet. It's orbiting a red dwarf star who I'll call Wolfie's mama. But here's the real kicker. Wolfie orbits within its star's habitable zone, which means it's a prime candidate for liquid water to exist on its surface. That's like hitting the exoplanetary jackpot. Ooh, wish I had a ticket. The study estimates that if Wolfie does have an Earth-like atmosphere, temperatures could rise as high as 55 degrees Fahrenheit, which would mean liquid water could pool on the planet's day side. But here's the catch. The exoplanet is tidally locked to its star, meaning that the same side always faces the star. Just imagine, one side of the planet is always basked in the warmth of its star, while the other is in eternal darkness. Like middle school. (laughs) Just kidding. The team behind the discovery believes it's a prime candidate for further studies. But we'll probably have to wait another 10 years for answers. Until then, we'll just have to keep searching the skies with our telescopes and crossed fingers. Our next planet is TOI 700e. Hmm, what's a good nickname? NASA has just discovered a new planet that's set to take the galaxies by storm, or shall we say by orbit. I'll nickname it Toys Were Us. It's almost the size of Earth, most likely has liquid water on its surface, and it's only 100 light-years away. We're not talking about a road trip, of course, but this is close enough in the grand scheme of things. Toys Were Us is the fourth planet in its system, and it's got a bit of a short orbit, just 28 days to circle its star. Well, at least you would have a birthday every month. (laughs) Hooray! This time, the discovery was made using the transit method. Planets themselves are incredibly small and hard to detect. But when a planet is in front of its star, it blocks some of the light coming from it, making it look a little bit dimmer. As soon as the planet moves away, the star gets brighter again. So, to find the planet, scientists watch very carefully to see if the star's brightness changes. If it does, that means there's probably a planet playing hide-and-seek with us. And that's how they discovered Toys Were Us. The test mission discovered it. It discovered 66 new exoplanets and 2,100 more candidates waiting to be confirmed. TESS has been very busy creating imaging for 75% of the sky. Talk about efficiency! Toys Were Us is located in the optimistic habitable zone, between planets C and D, but it may be tidally locked, just like Wolfie, so we might have to settle for a one-sided water world. The discovery of Toys Were Us is a promising prospect for future follow-up observations, and it demonstrates the potential for TESS to find even smaller exoplanets in the future. Who knows? It may find a new home for humanity among the stars one day. Or at least, a new vacation spot. Next, we have twins GJ1002b and GJ1002c. The galaxy just got a little bit closer to us with the discovery of two exoplanets, which I'll nickname Hansel and Gretel. 
that are just a stone's throw away from our solar system. That's right, these two Earth-like planets are located less than 16 light-years away, which is just a hop, skip, and a jump in space terms. For comparison, Proxima Centauri b is the closest Earth-mass exoplanet at 4.2 light-years away. So, these two new neighbors are among the closest to us. They both orbit a red dwarf star with barely one-eighth the mass of the Sun. It's quite cool and faint, but that's okay, since both planets are very close to it. Hansel takes 10 days to orbit its star, while Gretel takes just over 21 days. Even more birthdays, I guess. The discovery was made by an international scientific team and was no small feat. The team had to work together with two instruments, Espresso and Carminis. The result? A cafe latte. Nah. What they got were measurements so accurate, you could practically count the number of craters on the planet's surfaces. The big deal is, the planets are located in the habitable zone of their star and are just the right size, making them excellent candidates for future atmospheric studies. The lead author says, Nature seems bent on showing us that Earth-like planets are very common. With these two, we now know seven in planetary systems quite near to the Sun. Who knew our neighbors could be so friendly? In conclusion, the discovery of Hansel and Gretel is a giant leap for humankind. So let's all raise a glass of H2O, or whatever they drink on exoplanets, and celebrate it! The last planet on our list is LP890-9C, which I'll call Bob. This super-Earth, located about 98 light-years away, is roughly 40% larger than our home planet. Moreover, it has a twin, which I'll nickname Ray, which is up to 75% larger than Earth. More space is always good, right? The two planets orbit around the red dwarf star. Unfortunately, Ray is quite hot to the touch, with an estimated temperature of 253 degrees Fahrenheit, so don't touch. Its sibling, Bob, is located in the habitable zone of its star, making it a prime candidate for the potential of life. But let's remember that the actual temperature of the planets depends on their atmospheres. It's possible that Bob, being the outermost planet, has a runaway greenhouse effect, making it more like Venus than Earth. So it might be too hot to be habitable at all. But let's not lose hope yet. The James Webb Space Telescope, launched in December 2021, is on the case. With its cutting-edge technology and powerful instruments, including spectrographs, it can peer into the atmospheres of exoplanets and reveal which ones might be habitable. So let's see what it discovers. This planet has been listed as the second most favorable habitable zone terrestrial planet. Now it's on the list with seven other Earth-like planets, all about 40 light-years away from us. Maybe they'll become our new homes in the future. Maybe we should fix the home we have. But until then, enjoy this moment and celebrate all these new discoveries. Who knows how many more planets we'll find in the future, considering how much technology develops each year. Thousands? Millions? Meanwhile, Bob and Ray, Hansel and Gretel, Toys Were Us, Wolfie and her mama will all be out there waiting for us. The search for E.T. is on. It's most definitely on. With the successful launch of the James Webb Telescope, the search for Earth-like planets has become a riveting topic of worldwide attention. Apart from the James Webb Telescope, other tools are being used to find good Earth-like candidates. The TESS satellite and the Kepler telescope are at the forefront of searching for other Earths. After we first clear the air of a few pesky philosophical questions, we'll take a close look at these two searches and what the James Webb Telescope hopes to find. So why are we searching for Earth-like planets? Well, because we can. Incredible advances in Earth-bound telescope technology have enabled ultra-precise observations of starlight, which led to the earliest discovery of exoplanets. As planets go around stars, there's a gravitational interaction between the planet and the star. They pull each other. The planet's pull upon the star will cause the starlight to wobble back and forth ever so slightly as the planet or planets orbit the star. This has always been the case, but the wobble of the starlight was never able to be detected, because starlight always twinkles. You know, twinkle, twinkle, etc. Adaptive optics inside telescopes is the technological breakthrough that first enabled astronomers to find exoplanets by taking the twinkle out of starlight. 
Mechanical springs on the underside of telescope mirrors bend the mirrors ever so slightly to neutralize the distortion, the twinkle, caused by starlight passing through Earth's atmosphere. Without the glimmer of starlight, the slight wobble caused by planets pulling gravitationally on the stars is observable. The bigger the wobble, the more planets. It's called the astrometric method of exoplanet detection. Isn't that a mouthful? Whole star systems and literally thousands of exoplanets were inferred to exist around nearby stars by analyzing the wobbly patterns of starlight. But the planets themselves could not be seen. Suddenly, our solar system was not unique anymore. Astronomers got giddy over the inescapable conclusion that probably every star had planets. It became impossible not to ask the poignant question, is the Earth unique or are there other Earths? What's the big deal about finding Earth-like planets anyways? Well, considering all the financial resources the developed countries are spending on finding Earth-like planets, it can be said without a doubt that it's definitely a big deal. Including the launch James Webb Telescope, which cost 10 billion US dollars, the Kepler Space Telescope, which cost 550 million US dollars, and the TESS satellite, which cost 200 million US dollars, the investment in finding Earth like planets is certainly eyebrow raising. Now, if you keep in mind that these costs are just for the hardware and to get a sketch of the full magnitude of the search, you must also include the salaries of a team of data miners, PhD analysts, and postgrads all across the globe in universities, national space agencies, and private institutions. We will conclude that finding another Earth is truly an immense undertaking. Now, suppose we find one, then Earth is not alone anymore. It's not that we can actually go to any of these planets anytime soon. Interstellar travel requires some breakthroughs in physics and technology, and, well, we aren't there yet. But knowing that there are planets out there in the Milky Way that are like Earth in all the essential respects, like liquid water, oxygen, and habitability, will make space less foreboding, more welcoming, more exciting to study and explore. It may also give us more pride in our home planet and make us all better Earthlings. The triple mission looking for other Earths, the Kepler telescope, the TESS satellite, and the James Webb telescope use distinct approaches to find exoplanets. And the synonym TESS tells us what that method is. The T stands for transiting, and that's the key to the whole exoplanet search. E stands for, you guessed it, exoplanets, the target of the excellent investigation of another Earth. S stands for survey, because TESS looks at hundreds of thousands of nearby stars. And S stands for satellite, because TESS is orbiting Earth, unlike the James Webb Space Telescope, which will orbit the Sun. When a planet passes in front of a star, that is called a transit. The planet will block some of the light coming from the star. This decrease or dimming of the star can be measured. The dimming of starlight tells lots of things about the planet. By knowing how bright the star is and how much the star's light was dimmed by a transition in front of the star, we can tell how giant the planet is or how close it is. But we won't know which. Is it big or is it close? Until the planet's orbit is also timed. It means our test satellite must take long-duration videos of the stars. Ooh, video of the stars. Hollywood should like that. The test satellite doesn't have a telescope. It uses four CCD cameras to stream live long-duration videos of as many stars as possible. Hundreds of thousands of stars. Why so many? Well, because for a transit of a planet to be observed, it must pass directly between the test satellite's cameras and the star. If the planet is not on the exact line-of-sight angle between the star and Tess's cameras, it cannot be seen because it will not cut off any starlights. Planetary transits are rare. For example, Venus passes across Earth's view of the Sun only every couple hundred years. Yet, Tess's cameras are seeing many planetary transits among the hundreds of thousands of stars it takes streaming long-duration videos of, and you know what that means. It means there must be hundreds or thousands of times more planets than are observed by the transiting method. It is, therefore, an inescapable conclusion that every star has planets. Planets are everywhere. And now, the James Webb Space Telescope, with its giant 21-foot, 4-inch wide mirror, is entering the search. It is a technological marvel, a wonder of the modern world, a miracle of advanced engineering. Anticipation is reaching a fever pitch. 
But with the heightened anticipation comes an almost equal amount of trepidation. And some things can still go wrong before the James Webb Space Telescope returns its first pictures. After the Hubble Space Telescope, for example, was launched in 1990, a repair mission had to be launched in 1993. The mirror on the Hubble was not very well inspected, and its pictures were very blurry. Astronauts had to go up and execute a spectacular spacewalk to fix the mirror. After the fix, the pictures Hubble sent back were more precise than it was ever designed for. This is how an improved model appeared. That cannot happen with the James Webb Telescope. The Hubble orbits the Earth and is accessible to astronauts. The James Webb Space Telescope orbits the Sun and is well beyond the Moon, out of the reach of astronauts, because there is no spacecraft equipped to carry him there. It cannot be manually fixed if something goes wrong. Adding to the challenges, the James Webb Space Telescope has only one onboard camera to inspect any damage it may suffer or mechanical malfunctions that might develop in the harsh environment of interplanetary space. Any remote fixes will need to be done blind from Earth. The James Webb Space Telescope is now fully deployed. The 18 mirror segments will need to be aligned to produce a single image. This critically important process will take several months to complete once the telescope is fully deployed. 70 of the first 286 observation assignments of the telescope target exoplanets. Using data from previous exoplanet searches, it will not have to waste time searching for exoplanets. Their locations and orbits are already known. The James Webb Telescope will go right after them. The James Webb Space Telescope is not an optical telescope in the same sense as the Hubble Space Telescope or any ordinary telescope that sees visible light. It sees infrared light. The pictures of planets are expected to be bright dots, somewhat fuzzy if they have atmospheres. The spectra of the planets will yield the most information about the exoplanet. Any gases around an exoplanet will absorb some starlight as the starlight passes through the planet's atmospheres. Suppose there is methane in the planet's atmosphere, oxygen, or carbon dioxide, the gases that most indicate life. In that case, the James Webb Telescope will be able to pick them up by spectroscopic analysis. An entire portrait of the exoplanet can be formed from the infrared information, its temperature ranges, atmospheric content, the likelihood of liquid water, and even the probability of life. And that's a big deal! The James Webb Space Telescope has other missions to perform, too. It's assigned to examine star formation and planet formation in nebula in the Milky Way. Understanding how solar systems form is part of the search for another Earth. By detecting infrared light, the James Webb Space Telescope will peer to the farthest away galaxies, galaxies whose visible light gets blocked by dust and gas. These distant galaxies were formed shortly after the Big Bang. Galaxy formation is an essential mission for the James Webb Telescope. These most distant galaxies are accelerating away so fast that the light they emit is stretched below the frequency of the visible spectrum, into the infrared. The Great Telescope can see these previously invisible galaxies. We hope to learn about the mysterious dark energy that is causing the universe to expand at an ever-increasing velocity. Hope is high that the James Webb Space Telescope will significantly expand our knowledge of this amazing universe we all live in. The only life that we are certain about so far in the entire universe is on planet Earth. Whether that life is intelligent is, let's say, arguable. But anyway, it's not surprising that we're tirelessly searching for life on other planets. So far, they've discovered more than 4,000 of them. But what's even cooler? NASA has compiled a new list of 24 planets that aren't just Earth-like, they're better. The conditions on them are so good that they're more comfortable than on our planet. So let's examine some of them. KOI 5715.01 Hmm, let's be coy, shall we? <laughs> this wonderful planet is in the constellation Cygnus. And why is it so wonderful? Well, our sun is a yellow dwarf. And sorry sun, even though you're not bad at supporting life, there are some stars that can do it better. Nothing personal. The planet Koi 5715.01 orbits near an orange dwarf. Orange dwarfs are stars slightly smaller than our sun and have a little lower luminosity. Uh, did you like the alliteration there? 
Anyway, don't worry, it doesn't mean we're going to live in complete darkness. In fact, if the planet is found closer to the Sun and it has a thicker atmosphere, it may even be lighter and more colorful than on Earth. Now, our Sun has a very short lifespan. Right now, it has 7 to 8 billion years left to live, a little longer than Earth's age. But orange dwarfs can live from 45 to 70 billion years. This is great not only because we'll be able to hang out on this planet longer, but also because the planets around these stars have more time to form life. Now, ideally, we would need to find a planet next to an orange dwarf that is about 7 billion years old. It's very likely there will be at least some organisms there. Koi 571501 is about 5.5 billion years old. Yeah, it may not seem mature enough, but that's okay, neither do I. Our Earth is a billion years younger, and that didn't stop us. The planet is quite close to its star and is in a habitable zone. One year there lasts 190 days. Imagine going to elementary school and already getting a driver's license. <laughs> it's almost two times larger than the Earth. The average temperature there is 52 degrees Fahrenheit, which is slightly less than ours, 57. But it mostly feels warmer there because strong gravity helps it hold on to heat in the atmosphere longer. It's a little too far away though, like 3,000 light years from Earth, which is about 18 quadrillion miles. Yep, better bring a really big lunch with you. Koi 3010.01 this planet is found next to the star Koi 2010. This planet sounds like a very pleasant world. The average temperature on this planet is 67 degrees, so a little warmer than ours. But that's a good thing. Scientists believe that on a perfect planet, the temperature should be just about 10 degrees hotter than on Earth. The more heat there is on the planet, the more comfortable it is to live there. Also, the higher chances of developing life. The radius of this planet is nearly one and a half times larger than Earth. There's some atmosphere, although we're not yet sure about its composition. But it's probably like the Earth's. Scientists think that we'll find an ocean there, and it can cover up to 60% of the surface, which is also cool. In a perfect world, water and land should be distributed more evenly than on our planet. A little more land means a little more territory and resources, right? But listen. This planet is actually very similar to the Earth. The semblance is so striking that scientists believe we have an 84% chance to find life there. Of course, not necessarily an intelligent life, but at least some animals. Wouldn't that be cool? Now, what do you think they could look like? Hmm, very Earth-like planet, but with stronger gravity. Well, if someone lives there, they're probably big but have a small height and strong little legs. Sounds adorable and scary. But we won't be able to find out the truth anytime soon. So far, for us, these planets are microscopic dots in space. We only have some dry, boring data about them and don't even know what they look like. We'll have to wait until we can find a way to get closer to these planets. Kepler 186f This is also one of the best candidates for having life. This rather cute planet was nicknamed the Earth's cousin because it does have a strong resemblance. Anyway, these two planets are like sisters, not twins. Kepler-186f rotates near a red dwarf. Red dwarfs are stars even dimmer and smaller than orange dwarfs. Yeah, they'll also live for a very, very long time, but their luminosity is also quite low. However, Kepler-186f is closer to its star than we're to our sun, so it shouldn't be too dark there. Well, at least not night-like dark. The sky on this planet is sure to be an unusual shade of red, like sunsets on Earth. What do you think? Would you like to live on a planet with an eternal sunset? The size of this planet is about the same as Earth. Not bad, not perfect. Why so? Because the coolest planets are those that are bigger than Earth and have stronger gravity. Now you'll probably say, but wouldn't it be harder to walk there and even harder to get out of bed on Monday? <laughs> of course! But on the other hand, this planet will pull the atmosphere better. The atmosphere will be thicker and denser. This means more protection from the scary space stuff, more oxygen, and more heat. Not to mention the fact that the bigger planets have more space to settle. Awesome, right? But of course, the Earth's size is also an excellent choice. 
Another cool fact is that the tilt of Kepler-186f is about the same as ours. It means that there should be stable seasons and a normal day-night cycle. Do you know how important the tilt of the planet is? Let's look at Mars. Mars is also, in fact, found in the habitable zone of our Sun. But its tilt is very unstable, and as a result, the entire ocean that could have been on it once now completely dried up. Today, it's just a red desert, and there's no life there. At least not as far as we know. But you see how important these tiny details are? This planet is also quite far away from us, 490 light years. That's about 3 quadrillion miles. So yeah, we're just going to keep waiting for intergalactic travel. Kepler 62e and 62f These planets were called the most Earth-like before we discovered Kepler 186f. They're very comparable to our home. Kepler 62e is about one and a half times larger than Earth, and Kepler 62f is just slightly smaller than that. They're located in the constellation Lyra, which is about 1200 light years away from us. They both also orbit a red dwarf. One year on Kepler 62e lasts about 122 days, even less than on that first planet we talked about. Scientists believe that both 62e and 62f are sort of water worlds. Warm places mostly, or even completely, covered with water. If there is land there, it's probably just some islands. Hmm, a world consisting entirely of islands. A fantasy dream for some, think Hawaii. And a nightmare for others, think Megalodon. But if you're a fan of ancient marine animals, just imagine how gigantic they could be there. Still, there are many things we don't know about this planet. Does it have a surface? What about its composition, density? One day, maybe we'll be able to answer these questions. And so, that's it for the super-Earths. Of course, the original list is much longer, and you can go check it out on the internet. Now, the best thing about all this is that these are planets that are better than the Earth. But we also know thousands of other exoplanets that are just close enough to ours. And the odds are, a few of them have at least some form of life. But they're very, very far away, so we have no way to check it out right now. Perhaps, down the road, we'll find some cool creatures on many of them. One day, NASA will build a spaceship that can take us anywhere in the universe. Probably. And when this happens, we'll be able to find a new, beautiful home. Scientists even know what exactly they're looking for. We want a planet about twice the size of Earth with an average temperature of 77 degrees Fahrenheit with a pretty dense atmosphere. Bigger planet means more room for water and potential homes. And a dense atmosphere means more protection from nasty space stuff as well as more lush plants and cool animals. Thanks to the James Webb Space Telescope, we can now study exoplanets better from a distance. Of course, sending astronauts there would be much better, but oh well. Discovering new planets isn't easy, though. It's like trying to find a tiny firefly in a pitch-black forest. Scientists had to come up with a clever method to find very distant planets. It's called the transit method. Here's how it works. Scientists capture a series of snapshots of a distant star at different points in time. Then they scrutinize these images. They try to find any mysterious dark spots passing in front of the star. If they find one, it could very well be a planet. These snapshots hold the keys to uncovering vital information about these distant worlds. Not only do they tell us that there's a planet there, but also reveal its size, radius, and how close it is to its parent star. And most excitingly, they hint at whether it could ever become a new home for us. And now their research is finally bearing fruit. Recently, we've stumbled upon a tiny world nestled in the Cygnus constellation. It's called Kepler-22b. At first glance, it might not seem like a big deal, but this discovery has some pretty huge implications. This planet is located right in the Goldilocks zone. The Goldilocks zone, also known as the habitable zone, is a sweet area around a star where the conditions are just right for a planet to have liquid water on its surface. It's not too hot, so it doesn't evaporate, and it's not too cold, so it doesn't freeze. 
hence the name from the famous story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. So there might be water on Kepler-22b, and where there's water, there's a chance for life. And it's not just about life. Having a planet covered in oceans can be a game-changer for climate stability, all because vast water bodies act like nature's thermostats. When the sun beats down on the hot parts, the water soaks up some of that heat and spreads it around like a blanket. The scorching regions cool down and the icy ones warm up and thaw out. Back in the bad old days of our Earth, the moon played a crucial role in helping water puddles spread across our planet. This is what helped our world transform from a fiery nightmare into the vibrant, life-packed orb we call home. Kepler-22b has about the same year length as our Earth. And if we're right about the whole ocean thing, scientists think its average temperature could be around a cozy 12 degrees Fahrenheit. But if this world also sports an Earth-like atmosphere, temperatures might soar up to a toasty 72 degrees. This world isn't too far away from us, only 635 light years, which is about 3 quadrillion miles. Yeah, that's pretty close in space terms. Its sun is a yellow dwarf star, just like our sun, although there's a subtle difference. It's about 20% dimmer, so you won't see this star in the night sky even if you squint your eyes really hard. This star also happens to be quite chilly. Its temperatures are hovering around a frigid 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, making it the Arctic of the starry skies. Luckily, Kepler-22b snuggles up to its star a bit more closely than we do to the Sun. If it was in our solar system, it would find its place somewhere in between our familiar Earth and Venus. So the brightness and the temperature on this planet would be almost the same as on Earth. There are a couple of catches, though. For example, this world might be quite a gymnast. It could be twirling around its star in a totally different way than Earth does. It might be tilted, like Uranus. If that's the case, the temperatures of the planet could be quite weird. You'll experience bone-chilling winters, followed by scorching hot summers. So let's hope this theory isn't true. If Kepler-22b has a normal tilt, its climate would be pretty similar to what we enjoy here on Earth. The next problem is gravity. Kepler-22b is about 2.4 Earth's size, which means the gravity there would be stronger. You'd feel noticeably heavier on this planet. It would be just like doing your everyday activities on Earth, but everything would require more effort due to the stronger gravitational pull. Simple things like climbing stairs or even just breathing would require much more energy. So it's time to build some muscles. People would have to adapt to the new conditions by having denser bones and more robust cardiovascular systems just to move around comfortably. Unfortunately, that means doing sports would be much harder too. But hey, at least people might need to consume more calories to sustain their activities. So even though you'd have to exercise more, you'll also be able to eat more delicious food. Buildings on Kepler-22b would likely be square and robust to withstand the stronger gravity, which would kind of be problematic because taller structures are super challenging and expensive to build. But the most important question is, what kind of planet is that at all? Yeah, it's the big question mark. Scientists aren't even sure that Kepler-22b is Earth-like. It could be a gas giant, or even a water world. A water world is a planet with a vast ocean covering its surface. And it's not just some knee-level deep water. It'll be insanely huge. Thousands of miles deep and more, with no visible surface or any plants around for a long time. In that case, we could dream of building underwater cities. We could filter the water for sustenance and perhaps evolve into amphibious beings. Would that be a step backward? or a leap forward in our evolution. Some scientists also lean towards the idea that Kepler-22b might be a mini-Neptune. This is a legit planetary category, by the way, but that theory is still unproven. But let's say for our sake, it's a rocky planet. Even then, we're in the dark about its atmosphere. Does it even have one? What if it's like Venus, toxic enough to make your ex look like a bouquet of roses? 
In that case, we'd have to dig deep into the planet's depths for survival, figure out a heat source, and hope for the best. While there's a lot we don't know, let's keep our fingers crossed and assume the planet is Earth-like. In that case, what would Kepler-22 look like? Well, because of stronger gravity, the planet's landscape might be full of rugged mountains, deep valleys, and powerful rivers. If there's life on this planet, it's probably quite… small? Unusual plant and animal life should have adapted to the higher gravity. Trees might be shorter and sturdier. They'd struggle to break free from the soil. Animals might be pretty small too. They would also have strong, muscular legs for support. Perhaps these creatures would have numerous legs, making movement possible. They'd need to be small in stature, but gargantuan in strength. Muscular giant spiders sound not so bad, right? As for our beloved pets, they'd have to become little muscle-bound spheres just to survive. Also, the landscapes would feel very spacious because of the planet's sizes. A three-day flight in a plane sounds like quite the adventure. There are many possibilities with Kepler-22b. So far, we don't have a clear answer. But let's hope that scientists will find it before we load the first people into shuttles and send them to conquer the planet. That would be awkward if it turns out to be a gas planet or something like that. Among all the planets of the solar system, our Earth is unique, since it's the only one that has developed life. But what if we got a competitor? What if a second Earth appeared out of nowhere? Then there would be two different scenarios. The first is the destruction of both planets, and the second has an unexpected but pretty logical ending. But let's start with the catastrophic scenario. The second Earth with the same conditions could only exist if it received absolutely the same amount of sunlight as our planet. The orbit that our Earth follows is perfect for getting the necessary amount of solar heat. If we were a little further away, the entire surface of our planet would resemble Antarctica. And if Earth were a little closer to the Sun, we'd all live in a huge desert, inhabited by very few living beings. So, for the second Earth to be identical to ours, it would need to follow the orbit of our planet. Two massive objects can exist close to each other. The union of Earth and the Moon is a great example. But if the second object was as heavy and huge as our planet, there wouldn't be enough space for both of them. The gravity of two Earths would be a huge problem. The two worlds would collide because they would be pulled toward each other. This process would last for hundreds of millions of years. And in the end, the two planets would transform into one giant world. And their remnants would be flying around the newly formed planet, resembling the rings around Saturn. Or one of the planets would push the other out of its orbit. In this case, one of the Earths would hurtle toward the Sun and burn like a match in its atmosphere. It's also important to remember that Earth is moving at a speed of 67,000 miles per hour at all times. This is more than 80 times faster than the speed of sound. And now, imagine two huge planets that are flying toward each other at such a speed. Even a microscopic organism living in the mouth of a volcano wouldn't stand a chance to survive the collision of two Earths. Even the moon would be torn to pieces by the blast wave. But let's imagine that Earth's twin is following another orbit, somewhere between Mars and Earth. Even in this situation, people's lives would change forever. By the way, the theory that Earth might have a twin appeared long ago. Scientists of the past believed that the second planet could be hiding on the opposite side of the Sun. Thanks to modern technologies and astronomy, we know this theory isn't true. Otherwise, our telescopes and other equipment would have already caught some signals from this planet. Scientists study space objects thousands of light years away from us, so they would definitely notice another world in the neighborhood. But anyway, let's imagine that the second Earth does exist, and we've discovered it recently. The entire field of astronomy and astrophysics will immediately receive hundreds of billions of dollars in funding. The study of Earth's twin will become a priority goal for people. Experts will put forward hundreds of hypotheses about what the second Earth looks like and what's happening there. The planet is almost at the same distance from the Sun as we are. This means the weather must be the same there. Soon, scientists find out that Earth's doppelganger has liquid water and continents. But they aren't like ours. Their shapes and location are different. Most likely, life exists there too. 
But what is its origin? There's a hypothesis that life on our planet appeared thanks to amino acids brought here by a meteorite. It's highly improbable that the same thing happened to another world. Life most likely emerged there in a completely different way. Perhaps the fish didn't get out of the water on that planet, and the first intelligent creatures appeared in the ocean. These could be amphibians with scales and fins, or octopus-like monsters with huge tentacles. Fish on the second Earth could have come out of the water and grown limbs. But what if they didn't like walking on the ground? Then this world might be inhabited by intelligent bird people. Or life could have originated deep in the soil. Then evolution would create humanoid moles or highly developed worms. To find out for sure, scientists send a rover there. A similar mission to Mars was a success, so there shouldn't be any problems with this one. People on Earth are waiting. What will the rover find on the other side? It will take several years for the ship to get there. Strangely, two days after the launch, it returns. But wait, this is not our space probe. All this time, the inhabitants of the second Earth have been watching our planet too. At one point, they also sent a probe. It's made of the same materials as ours. It has a camera and a recording device. But people are worried because the rover looks similar to a mechanical spider. Can it be that giant tarantulas live in that world? Scientists understand that we need to communicate. We send our guests a radio signal with some information about our civilization. They catch this message and send their own. It contains strange symbols that resemble scratches. Linguists all over the world are trying to decipher it. Meanwhile, astronomers send the guests a recording of human speech. A few days later, our satellites catch a message from our space neighbors with their voices. Scientists are about to play the recording. The whole world is listening with bated breath, and it's a growl. A terrible and absolutely incomprehensible growl. It has pauses and an unusual rhythm, but it's nothing resembling human speech. The whole planet is panicking. All countries are preparing for an invasion. The most important thing now is to build shields to protect the planet. No one can decrypt the message. It's possible that our neighbors can't understand us either. People make a last attempt to establish some contact. We send a video to explain to our guests with the help of gestures and signs that we only want peace and collaboration. The answer doesn't take long to wait. Our satellite receives their video file. Scientists play back the recording, and it's shocking. We see dinosaurs in robotic suits. Life on the second Earth has been developing in the same way as on our planet. But the infamous colossal meteorite didn't fall there. Over millions of years of evolution, dinosaurs have become sentient. In the video, they're growling and pointing with their claws at the picture of our Earth. Then they start growling even more loudly. And is it laughter? The recording ends. People consider this the announcement of the invasion. Several years have passed. During this time, scientists have exchanged messages with dinosaurs several times. And it seems we're beginning to understand them. It turns out that the reptiles also want peace. They say that their planet was once inhabited by humanoids similar to humans, but a massive flood wiped them away. Dinosaurs managed to survive and evolve into intelligent beings. It will take many years before people set foot on their planet, and when this happens, humanity will feel relieved, realizing that we're not alone. But what if there was no intelligent life on the second Earth? People would also be happy. We would know that we'd always have another home. Perhaps we'd start exploring Earth's twin right away, or begin mining its resources to replenish ours. In any case, our lives wouldn't change immediately because that land would be too far away from our planet. Dozens of generations would pass before people begin settling on the second Earth. Our homeland planet would be losing more and more resources, so everyone would want to move to a new world. In the beginning. Only the richest would be able to do it, but with time, space travel would become cheaper. People would probably invest a lot of money to build a paradise on the second Earth. If this happened, we'd be visiting this world during our vacation to breathe fresh air and enjoy nature. In any case, the human population would grow. This means that sooner or later, the second Earth would become as loaded as the first one, and then people would start searching for a new home among the stars. By the way. 
If any life exists on a planet similar to ours, it's likely to look like octopuses. There's even a theory that octopuses came to Earth from some other world. Any animal has several evolutionary stages of development. For example, elephants and mammoths descended from one common ancestor five to six million years ago. Looking even further, almost all mammals evolved from one ancestor they shared with reptiles. Each species has been changing over millions of years. But not octopuses. They suddenly appeared on a family tree. From the point of view of evolution, squids would have to evolve into octopuses millions of years from now. But look, they're already here. Besides, octopuses are incredibly smart. Their genetic code is much more diverse than the human one. They may be visitors from another planet that is similar to ours. But of course, this is only a hypothesis. This is Neptune. The next stop is Pluto. Stand clear of the closing doors, please. One day, with top-notch future technologies, one stop from Neptune to Pluto won't seem much further than Times Square from Bryant Park today. There are huge ice mountains on Pluto, valleys that go further than your eyes can see, 160-mile large craters, almost as big as the largest one on Earth, and no life. The reasons are obvious. The long distance between Pluto and the Sun guarantees freezing temperatures on that dwarf planet. It also ensures a trip of a few billion miles. Plus, it's smaller than the Moon, so it would get crowded very soon if people started dwelling there. Still, there's one reason which makes life there not that far-fetched. The Sun has a lifespan and cycles within it. Our solar system used to be nothing but a cloud of gas and dust. As a result of a gravitational collapse at the center of this cloud, the gas and dust started gathering in specific, denser places. These pulled more and more matter as time went on, and something called conservation momentum made the mass start rotating and heating up because of immense pressure. Later, there appeared a disk similar to what Saturn has, but it was made of entirely different substances. And right in the center, there was the ball that eventually became the Sun. A protostar is a young star that's still gathering its mass, and that's exactly what the Sun was before the temperatures and pressures inside of it lighted up its core. Millions of years later, it became the Sun we see every day. But it won't stay this way forever. It will heat up even more and eventually get bigger and denser, turning into a red giant. It may one day get big enough to swallow up Venus and Mercury. Chances are, it might swallow even planet Earth. Even if it doesn't devour our planet, the sun might get close enough to touch us. Well, if this happened, life on Earth wouldn't be possible. But then, in just a few minutes, the sun loses about 40% of its mass and shrinks about 10 times what it used to be. It's not as bright and, indeed, not as hot as it used to be. By this moment, Earth will have already been deserted. People might want to start traveling around space or settle down on another planet where life is sustainable, like the exoplanet Kepler-62f, which, by the way, is even bigger than Earth. While all of this was happening, Pluto was changing. Before, every resource was frozen inside of the dwarf planet. Water, gases like methane, carbon monoxide, you name it. But as the sun was reaching its peak luminosity, Pluto was slowly warming up and losing a lot of what it had to the vastness of space. At the same time, an atmosphere formed up. If the atmosphere gets thick enough, it would create favorable life conditions. Then, instead of spaceships, a tiny percentage of us would be able to set up colonies on the dwarf planet. The temperature is comfortable there, almost t-shirt weather. It even resembles Earth a tiny bit. Canyons filled with water, beautiful endless fields with trees, and lots of space to run around, and mineral water pockets on the ground, good enough to drink. Pluto's rotations are different than Earth's. An Earth day is 24 hours, and sometimes it still feels like it never ends. But on Pluto, a whole rotation around the Sun takes 153 hours, because it's pretty far away from the Sun. After several hours without sleep, we get tired and our eyes get red. It means we'd have to take several naps throughout the day on Pluto. A year on Pluto equals 248 Earth years. Unless we come up with some sort of technology to get us to live that long, our entire lifespan would be less than half a year on the dwarf planet. So, houses on Pluto might need to be equipped with cryo chambers. Whenever you feel like dreaming for a long time, you jump in it and wake up 50 Pluto days later. 
on the dwarf planet, there are also seas and beaches. So it's just like a tiny Earth, far away from the actual Earth. The food on Pluto could be tastier. We might find a way to make the ingredients more savory and even try to grow them faster during the trip. You plant a carrot, and two days later, it's ready to be in your salad. There could also be new ingredients for our salads on Pluto. Maybe two meter tall mushrooms we've never seen before. The animals we would take with us on the trip would get released into their new home forever. And with time, they would evolve and adapt to their new environments. The law of the jungle could change a bit too. Lions might not be kings anymore. Deer are. Their antlers are twice the size of what they used to be. But to be fair, so are the deer. Most of the animals that were already here used to live underwater. But with time, the amphibians started shifting to the surface, just like Earth at the beginning of life. Pluto could only be a temporary home though. Once the sun has finally reached its final phase, Pluto would get frozen and lifeless again. People instead would need to try to find a planet that stays in the Goldilocks zone of another galaxy. The Goldilocks zone is the exact proper distance from the star like the sun, where the temperature is perfect for the water to stay liquid. It's the rule scientists search for when looking for other planets that can sustain life. We can try setting new colonies on one such planet, or even try to set up our own artificial home. Not exactly a planet or a spaceship, but a combination of both. Something huge built right in space. Say, a wheel with gravity everywhere we go, so we don't fall off. It would float in space toward the new exoplanet, capable of fitting entire states in. This whole trip might happen just because the sun first grew too much, and then, having reached the culmination of its life cycle, it would finally become a white dwarf. It's gonna be a pretty long journey, and entire generations will be born here. You'll have a choice, sleep your way through the journey until humans finally reach their new exoplanet, or enjoy the trip in this fantastic spaceship. There's all you need on board, malls bigger than those on Earth, large futuristic cities, even places to farm, fields with rich soil made artificially, and finally, after a long journey, the exoplanet. It's even somewhat better than Earth. The planet is giant and has more continents. The continent's center isn't as far from oceans, which means there aren't as many desert areas. Though the sun of this planet is an orange dwarf, it's not as hot as our yellow dwarf sun today. It's a bit smaller, but here's the kick. Orange dwarfs live somewhat longer. They remain stable for between 15 billion and 45 billion years. Despite that, this new planet is full of rainforests because the planet itself is warmer. It means more biodiversity and creatures we've never seen before. But even if nothing out there is suitable, we could try and terraform this planet instead. If we take Mars as an example, we could create a greenhouse effect by smashing ice-rich comets and releasing ammonia in them, making the planet warmer. We could also start planting trees. We'd probably need some Earth soil to do that, or we'd have to modify Mars's soil to be similar to ours. Sooner rather than later, the atmosphere would be close to the one we have on Earth. We'd be able to breathe too, because of the trees. Then, we can melt Mars's polar ice caps and voila, water. The problem is the solar winds and sun explosions that might strip it of an atmosphere just as quickly as we can create one, if not faster. It has no magnetosphere either, which means it can't protect us from radiation. So long-term Mars wouldn't be a good choice. Maybe out there in the vastness that is space, there is a perfect planet waiting for us. Okay, quick space riddle. Why is the search for life in the universe like a tree? Because you're always looking for a place to plant it. You know, plant it, plant it. Okay, settle down. Anyway, water is the basis of life in any part of the universe, so potentially inhabited planets must have liquid water on them to support life. An incredible number of circumstances must come together for this. The planet must be in the habitable zone of the star. Then the temperature and atmospheric pressure on the planet's surface will be suitable for simple life forms to begin to evolve. A little closer to the star and the water will evaporate, leaving no chance for oceans and seas to form. This is what happened on Venus. It has a size and mass similar to the Earth, but it's too close to the Sun and no life can exist on its surface. Too far from the star and the planet becomes too cold. Water can only exist in the form of ice on the surface, 
and there just might be liquid water deep below. Neptune is one example of this. In addition, the planet must be solid and have an atmosphere that protects it from solar radiation and allows living organisms to breathe. In our galaxy alone, there are countless stars. Really, you can't count on them. Near each one of them may be a planet. They're called exoplanets, and some of them may be in the habitable zone and have everything for life to form on them. From a list of 4,500 known exoplanets, scientists have identified 24 that can be superhabitable. This is the type of planet that is suitable for the existence and evolution of life even more than the Earth. Such planets must be twice as massive as the Earth and 1.3 times larger. A bigger size means stronger gravity and a denser and warmer atmosphere. This will ensure a greater diversity of all living organisms on the planet. In addition, we should pay attention to the host star around which the superhabitable planets will orbit, and there should be a McDonald's nearby. Ideally, it should be smaller than the Sun and have a lifespan of at least 15 to 30 billion years. For comparison, the lifespan of the Sun is under 10 billion years, and it took about 4 billion for complex life forms to appear here. Stars such as the Sun can simply run out of fuel before life can develop on its exoplanet. Scientists suggest focusing on dwarf stars. They're smaller and less luminous than the Sun, but their lifespan can be between 20 and 70 billion years. This will give living organisms enough time to develop and evolve. Climactic conditions on superhabitable planets will also be different. The average temperature should be 8 degrees Fahrenheit higher than on Earth. And there should be more water in the form of clouds, liquid, and humidity. These conditions are the most favorable for biodiversity. So the whole planet would be looking like tropical forests on Earth. All 24 candidates for the title of Better Than Earth hey, are more than 100 light years away from us. And with the advent of the new generation of telescopes, we'll probably be able to find out exactly if there is life there and if the conditions there are suitable for humans. Now, let's take a look at the potentially inhabited exoplanets. Tea Garden B It's an exoplanet that orbits a red dwarf star about 12 light years away from the solar system. Typically, red dwarfs can emit flares that blow away the atmosphere of the planets in its orbit. But this host star is calm and relatively passive. Tea Garden B has almost the same mass as the Earth. It makes a complete circle around its star in about five days. Yep, you got it right! A year on Tea Garden B is less than a week on Earth. Hold on to your hats! The furthest potential inhabited planet is Kepler 1638b. It's in the constellation Cygnus, about 3,000 light years away from us. It belongs to the Super Earth class, it's twice as wide and four times as heavy as our home planet. The gravity on it will feel much stronger. Even a normal jump will be much harder for you than on Earth. Although, if this planet is really inhabited, local life is used to such conditions. LHS 1140b This planet is very rocky and solid. Although its size is only 40% larger than the Earth, it's seven times as massive. It has a strong gravity of 3.25 g's. For comparison, when you take off on an airplane, you experience an overload of about 1.5 g's. So on this planet, you'd barely be able to stand on your feet. Because of its large mass, this planet has a thicker atmosphere. And because of the greenhouse effect, its temperature can be above 19 degrees Fahrenheit. And it rotates around its star quite quickly. It makes a full circle in just 24 days. And now, let's look at the constellation Aquarius. Here's an ultra-cold dwarf, Trappist-1. A small planet orbits in its habitable zone. It's three times lighter than the Earth. Its temperature is similar to ours, but the gravity is half as weak. But we would still feel comfortable there. Remember the people that went to the moon? There, the gravity is only 16% of the Earth's. That's what makes the astronauts move so funny. Kepler-452b is in a system that resembles the older sister of ours. The host star is only 11% older than our Sun, 
and is almost 2 billion years older. The exoplanet itself is 6.5 billion years old, compared to 4.5 billion of Earth's. But these sisters are very far from each other. If you travel at the speed of the New Horizon spacecraft, it will take about 26 million years to get there. So bring a big lunch! This is the closest exoplanet to us, Proxima Centauri b. It orbits the red dwarf Proxima Centauri, which is the closest star to the Sun. This planet is just 4.2 light-years away from us. Its size and mass are very similar to those of the Earth. It probably has an icy structure, like Neptune. Although Proxima Centauri is the closest star after the Sun, we can't see it with the naked eye because it's too dim. So, all these planets, including the 24 that scientists have recently found, are in the habitable zone of their host stars. And, in theory, we can colonize them and make them suitable for human life in the future. But here we'll have to solve one big problem. Even the nearest exoplanet is too far away for us today. Our modern rockets can fly at five times the speed of sound, and even at such speeds, it will take us more than 100,000 years to get to Proxima Centauri on one of them. Well, we need to come up with something a bit faster to travel to a new home on one of these exoplanets. And perhaps scientists already have the answer. Warp drive. Ooh. This is a piece of technology that will allow us to manipulate space and time. It creates a kind of a bubble in which the normal laws of motion don't work. So the spacecraft will be able to significantly exceed the speed of light. And this isn't science fiction. Humanity already has such technology, although just in theory yet. It's Alcubierre warp drive. And no, I didn't make that up. Since no object that has mass can travel at the speed of light, we need to do one trick. The spacecraft has to move by compressing the space in front of it and expanding it behind it. Thus, not only the ship is moving, but also the space-time inside this warp drive bubble. And the maximum speed can be 10 times that of light. But to warp the space-time, the ship must be incredibly large. And to power it, we'll need the amount of energy close to what the whole planet of Jupiter generates. Still, recent calculations of NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab show that the ring around the ship which should create the so-called warp field, shouldn't be perfectly round, as it was thought before. It can be more donut-shaped. Ah, donuts. This will greatly simplify the design and construction and will make it possible to test this technology on a spacecraft the size of a Voyager 1 probe. Even though it still seems impossible, scientists are already saying that there is hope. And while we don't know what technology will be used, in 2069, NASA plans to launch its first interstellar mission to explore potentially habitable planets outside of our solar system. Various rumors say that the speed of light can be achieved with laser technology. If the probe is very small, it can be launched to the Alpha Centauri star at almost the speed of light. There are also two other alternatives to power spaceships. These are nuclear energy and energy from matter and antimatter collisions. Ooh, these technologies are still a mystery to humanity, though. Well, for the time being, stay tuned. For decades now, scientists have been discovering new planets outside our solar system. By 2023, we've found more than 5,000 of them, and many of these exoplanets could potentially even have life. Now, if you're ready for a wild ride through space, let's find out what potentially habitable planets we've discovered in the last few years. LP890-9b and LP890-9c. Buckle up, because we're heading to LP890-9 a red dwarf star located a whopping 105 light-years away from Earth. This star is quite cool compared to our Sun, in terms of temperature, of course. It has a temperature of about 4,700 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, this little guy may be small, but it's packed with surprises. For example, two exoplanets orbiting around it. Moreover, both of these planets are likely terrestrial, meaning they are rocky, just like Earth. 
First up, we have LP90-9b, which was discovered in 2022 using the TESS telescope and later confirmed by the Speculoos telescope. This planet is a super-Earth, weighing in at about 13 times the mass of our own planet. It's also slightly bigger than Earth, with a radius about 1.3 times larger. And if you thought Mercury's orbit around the Sun was quick, just wait until you hear about LP890-9b. It takes about three days to complete one lap around its star. Imagine falling asleep in freezing winter and waking up in hot summer. But the real showstopper here is LP890-9c. This one was discovered by the Speculoos Telescope. It's a bit further out from the star and takes a leisurely 2.5 times longer to orbit than LP890-9b. It's also a bit larger than Earth. But its real claim to fame is its location within the habitable zone of its star. That means it could potentially have liquid water on its surface and a climate suitable for life. Now this planet becomes a prime candidate for studying its atmosphere using the James Webb Space Telescope. But hold on, it's not all sunshine and rainbows for LP890-9C. It's also really close to its star, meaning it's full of radiation that could potentially make it less habitable. And to top it off, it's tidally locked, just like our moon. That means one side of the planet is always facing the star and is incredibly hot while the other is always in the dark and really cold. Scientific models suggest that this planet could be more like Venus in terms of its atmosphere and climate. And Venus is, you know, isn't known for being human-friendly. But despite these challenges, LP890-9c is still a fascinating exoplanet worth studying further. Who knows what secrets it may hold? Let's move on to the next candidates. GJ-1002b and GJ-1002c, an international team of scientists led by researchers at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias, has found two Earth-like planets just 16 light years away from our solar system. They both orbit a red dwarf star called GJ-1002. Our sun is a yellow dwarf, which means that GJ-1002 is much cooler and fainter than our own sun, but that's okay. Both planets are very close to its star, so it shouldn't be too cold or dark on them. These planets, called GJ1002b and GJ1002c, are both in the habitability zone of their star, meaning they could potentially support life. Also, both of them have masses similar to that of Earth. GJ1002b is the inner planet and takes about 10 days to orbit its star while GJ1002c takes a little over 21 days. These planets are great candidates for studying their atmospheres and could even be targets for future missions to search for signs of life. The most important thing is that these two planets could potentially support life, and that's pretty cool. Plus, the fact that they're located so close to us means that we might be able to visit them someday. Well, maybe not us personally, but you know. And maybe one day, we'll even find some extraterrestrial life on one of these planets. Now that would be out of this world. But moving on to the next one. Kepler-1649c Kepler-1649c, also known as the Lost Exoplanet, was rediscovered in 2022 by scientists using data from NASA's Kepler spacecraft. This exoplanet is located about 300 light years away from Earth and orbits a small, cool star called Kepler 1649. It's about the same size as Earth, and just like the previous ones, it's located in the habitable zone of its star. Initially, the data about this planet was discarded. A special computer program called RoboVetter, written to automatically sift through the volumes of Kepler data, labeled this candidate as a false positive. In other words, the program thought it was just some kind of an error or interference. Fortunately, the researchers double-checked such things, and when rechecking the data, they managed to rescue poor Kepler-1649c. Now we know that this is a terrestrial planet just like Earth, and if it really does contain water, there could even be life there. But don't pack your bags just yet. There are still many unknowns about Kepler-1649c. 
For example, we don't know what its atmosphere is like or what kind of surface it has. It's also possible that the planet is tidally locked, just like LP890-9C. That would be, uh, unpleasant. That's why Kepler-1649C is definitely worth further study. Maybe it turns out to be a perfect place for us to set up a vacation home in the future. Just make sure to bring plenty of sunscreen since the planet is pretty close to its star and things could get pretty toasty. Kepler-1638b. This exoplanet is located about 5,000 light years from Earth in the constellation Cygnus. It's also located in the habitable zone of its star. It was discovered in 2020 by the Kepler spacecraft through the process called transiting. They basically take a bunch of photos of the star at different times. After that, the programs analyze these photos and look for small spots and dots on them. These tiny dips in brightness may mean that a planet was passing by the star. Kepler-1638b is a bit of an oddball compared to most exoplanets we've found so far. It's about four times the mass of Earth and has a radius about two times that of Earth, making it a super-Earth exoplanet. Its orbital period is about 260 days, which is quite close to our Earth, and that's great! Finally, at least somewhere, winter and summer will flow normally. Kepler-1638b could have some liquid water there. That's why it's also a good candidate for further study, to see if it could potentially support life. Let's hope that we'll find out more about this planet in the future. And finally, the last one. Kepler-438b Kepler-438b is an exoplanet located approximately 640 light-years away from Earth in the constellation Lyra. It was discovered in 2015 by the Kepler Space Telescope. One of the most interesting things about Kepler-438b is its size and location. It's about the same size as Earth and also orbits within the habitable zone of its star. But there are a few catches. For one, Kepler-438b orbits around a red dwarf star, which are known for their high levels of solar radiation and flare-ups. This could make the surface of the planet too hostile for life as we know it. In addition, Kepler-438b has a much shorter year, only around 35 Earth days long. This could lead to extreme temperature fluctuations on the planet's surface, but maybe it's home to some hardy extraterrestrial life forms that have adapted to its unique conditions. Or maybe not. Either way, it's definitely worth keeping an eye on. This is a small list of exoplanets that we've discovered in recent years. Now, with the use of new technologies, we'll be able to find new exoplanets much more often. Let's hope that at least a few of them will really be inhabited.